Good afternoon, and welcome to day six of Energy Finance 2020 Online. I'm Sandy Buchanan, Executive Director of the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio. Our session today is on this question, are petrochemicals the final frontier for fossil fuel survival? Our moderator is Lisa Hamilton. Lisa is the Adaptation Programs Director at the Georgetown Climate Center in Washington, DC. Prior to this job, Lisa was the uh, Climate and Energy Director at the Center for International Environmental Law, a consultant to the National Council of Environmental Legislators, and a an regulatory and technical consultant for IEFA. And now I'd like to turn this over to Lisa to get us started. Great, thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much. And um, welcome everybody. I'm really excited uh, about this session this afternoon on petrochemicals. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of uh, housekeeping matters. Um, we're gonna do this uh, session a little bit of a different way. We're gonna have our first speaker pause for some Q&A, a second speaker, and then um, some more Q&A. And just the second part will be a little bit interactive. What I hope you all do will do, because we really want your questions, is to please place it in the chat box, and we will answer those questions at the end of the session. So again, as Sandy mentioned, we are talking about petrochemicals today. And before we get started, just to give a little bit of context about how this particular industry is particularly changing rapidly. Um, since about 2010, um, the petrochemical industry, and particularly its infrastructure, has faced an incredible boom by virtue of the expansion uh, and availability of shale gas um, by hydraulic fracturing. Um, so, but some more commonly called fracking. And with that boom, huge supply and availability of cheap natural gas inspired um, hundreds of projects. By one estimate, I believe in 2018, American Chemistry Council estimated over 300 petrochemical related projects that were fueled by um, natural gas, estimated $200 billion worth of projects. Now, since that time, when those projects were first estimated, um, the Economics looked very favorable for the industry. There were projections for global growth, projections for increased demand of both plastic, particularly single use plastic, and for petrochemicals like fertilizers. Um, but here we are in 2020 and the world looks very different. Um, we are very fortunate today to have uh, Tom Sanzillo, the Director of Finance for um, Aiva, um, he is a, um, <laughs> he's really, uh, for the last decade has really been a cornerstone of Aiva. I feel very fortunate to have had um, the pleasure to work with him. Um, he has, um, he's gonna speak to us a little bit today um, based on his 30 years of both public and private experience as the first and former deputy comptroller for the state of New York, where he had um, billions of dollars of assets under management and manage their bond portfolio as well. Um, he's gonna provide us some insight about the market dynamics that are currently confronting petrochemical industry and the oil and gas sector, because in many ways, um, petrochemical single-use plastic was projected as a plan B for the industry as global demand for um, oil and gas with and sort of offset by the um, increased rise of electric vehicles and decreased demand for um, oils for automobiles. Um, our second speaker today is Sharon Levine. She is a longtime resident of the fifth district of St. James Parish in Louisiana. Um, she has been part of the legacy of African-Americans born and raised in St. James Parish who are part of that 85 mile stretch between Baton Rouge and New Orleans called Cancer Alley. Um, in some areas um, within that region, um, individuals are 50%, um, 50 times, the cancer rates in those areas are 50 times higher than what appears in the rest of the country. Um, she will share her story of building uh, Rise St. James, a faith-based organization and challenging um, the intent of both the governor and industry to build more petrochemical facilities. So what we will do now, um, we will start with video um, from Tom and when that video ends, we'll launch into some questions and answers. <laughs>
Thanks everyone for logging into IEFA's virtual conference. Um, every year we've had this for a number of years. This is different. Um, um, and where we're trying to do is the same thing we've always done, which is to share our research and meld our research with our uh, teams uh, all over the world of um, organizations, environmental organizations, labor, business, what have you, so that the, the, our organizing work and our research work are aligned and we are a more powerful force. Um, AIFA's work um, recently um, in the plastic sector um, has resulted in us gaining a whole new uh, vantage on uh, the oil and gas sector. And that's really what I want to share with you um, today, um, where we've where we've been and, and where we think um, where we think we're going. Um, the problem from a financial point of view is that prior to the pandemic, the um, oil and gas sector was suffering from an oversupply of resources. Essentially, what happened was fracking, um, the uh, an increase in the production due to a new form of technology that produced um, more oil and gas than um, was needed, and that drove down prices so that um, those who were buying and selling oil and gas, um, particularly those who were using it for the purposes of plastics, um, did well um, initially and um, received lower prices. At the same time, plastics was, were increasing in demand around the world. And so those two factors uh, made it a market signal, and the market signal was build more cracker plants, build more um, plastics manufacturing. At the same time this was going on, a third factor that's really little understood was going on, and that is that the oil and gas sector, which historically has made its profits from oil and gas extraction um, were, was not making as much money as they used to. In fact, for the last 10 years, the oil and gas sector has um, been last in the, in the uh, stock market, whereas for decades before that, they were first. They went from the world's most powerful um, sector to one of the weakest. Um, and so they turned to the uh, petrochemical sector, um, which had always been an investment for them, but it was never a really lucrative investment. But they now are looking to say, well, it's stable and it may be smaller and we will resign ourselves to smaller profits and, and boost our um, petrochemical investments. Um, and so the, um, you, you found then around the world, this was a global phenomenon, not just to, in the United States, Russia, Qatar, China, Iran, all the major countries that were invo involved with oil and gas announced new investments in petrochemicals. Um, that um, drove the, um, the process um, in between 2009 and 2013, was a, a whole lot of planning and then the new, new announcements, but it also oversupplied the market. And so when they were trying to plan the, the, um, the sites between uh, 2009 and 2013, they were planning in an environment where um, uh, plastics were about a dollar a pound. And now in the current market, um, which is now they've come to fruition, many of the projects are going online, they're in construction, um, and they are facing a market where the price is 40 to 60 cents a pound, which substantially reduces the revenues to the point of making them only marginally profitable, as opposed to before where they look to be um, lucrative um, and robust. Um, recently, um, the uh, ICIS, which is a leading um, analytical um, organization for the oil and gas sector, um, has announced that the um, this build out, which was occurring all over the world, um, is over. It's not going to occur. Um, many of the proje uh, projects that are in construction will complete construction, but face a difficult market. And that the pandemic um, um, caused a major drop in demand at a time when they were already struggling. Um, and so you have a, a double whammy, if you will, that, that occurred. Um, and what also surfaces is a new set of, um, of risks that no one really saw before. They saw the price risk, which now is from a dollar down to you know, 40 to 60% lower. Um, but there are other factors now that have come to the, come to the surface 
pre-pandemic um, economic analyses were that the economy was going to grow much slower than was necessary for the plastics um, industry. And when the economy grows slowly, there's less demand for plastics. So you have another risk factor. You also have a um, greater competition among the, the uh, companies that are involved. Um, as you would imagine, they're all building new plants and they're all looking to um, get into the market. And so the competition um, results in price discounts, which further depresses prices and makes the, um, the projects more um, financially problematic. Um, then on the demand side, you have um, a new recycling market for plastics that's growing um, and it's in its formative stages, um, but it too is, is uh, whittling away at some of the market share for the new cracker plants and plastics manufacturers, as well as local governments in the United States and around the world seeking to curb the use of single purpose um, uh, plastics. So you have a series of risks, the price risk, the oversupply, you have slower economic growth and, and the like. Um, and so other analysts like IHS Market, which is probably the most prominent in the world, has basically said that the plans that were, were hatched during the 2009-2013 period were hatched on a series of economic assumptions that are no longer true and that there is a real risk that many of the projects are going to be canceled and, um, and many of them that will open will open to a very weak financial environment. So the response to the pandemic and the response to this environment is that many of the petrochemical and oil companies have been cutting their capital budgets and we see um, a, a, a facility that's supposed to be in construction right now in Ohio, uh, PTTGC, it's called, it's a Thailand company. Um, they have put off their final investment decision indefinitely, looking to see if the markets will, will turn around. Um, Sasol, which is a South African company, um, has opened up a chemical plant, and that plant uh, in uh, Louisiana um, had suffered from price increases and mismanagement, and they had to tell their shareholders that they were not going to be making 10.5% profit, but were going to be making about 6% profits. Um, so we're seeing the, um, the deterioration of the, of the uh, plastics and cracker markets right before our eyes. And so what IEFA is going to be doing is looking in the future at five or six major questions. Um, basically, is the economy going to expand at a rate that will absorb the excess plastics um, and will do so fast enough to maintain profits for the industry. Um, the second is as the economy recovers, um, will the companies who really have the same business model simply revert to a, a mode of um, oversupply again and to start building once prices start to turn around um, again and uh, running into the same problems that were there before the pandemic? Um, similarly, during the pandemic, things shifted within the plastic industry so that um, food packaging, medical supplies and all became much more important and automobile and industrial plastics you know, took a big hit. Um, how that rebalances is a very big um, factor for the industry and how it will recover um, if it does at all. And we're going to be looking at whether or not the large consumers um, like Coca-Cola of, of plastics, who have um, committed to um, uh, greater levels of recycling content, uh, do they keep those commitments? And, uh, um, and that'll be a very significant factor for whether or not we're going to see a substantial you know, reduction and further weakening of the, uh, of the cracker uh, industries. We're also so, uh, looking to see if um, as these plants go online, there will probably be uh, right, there will be substantial write-offs in the billions of dollars and whether or not the banks are then going to make it more difficult for them to borrow, causing the costs of the, implant, the plants and the facilities to rise. So for, in conclusion, the, the at, people who are advocating today to um, um, curb or eliminate some of the, the, the plastics um, uh, products, um, right now are doing so at a time when the industry is in, is in severe distress. 
So the promises that many of these companies have been making to local officials, to communities, to allow them in the promises of jobs and taxes and better economic development um, are, are questionable and they need to be scrutinized you know, very, very carefully. Um, the outlook for the uh, um, petrol chemical industry um, is one where they would like us to believe that they are good partners for economic development. And we're seeing uh, a significant series of questions um, to cause us to, um, to be skeptical about that. And then finally, what we are also looking for is we're looking for um, new uh, partners and new allies some from within the plastics industry itself and the recycling sector and for the companies who are consumers looking to improve um, the, um, the recycled content um, and looking for ways to, um, to reduce the dependence on plastics and with it improve the, um, the environment and um, combat climate change while still sustaining uh, an industry that is in a very you know, complicated uh, situation. Um, so that's where we're going. That's how we've been working and, and how we're going to um, continue to, um, to work in the future. Great. I think we're back now. So first of all, thank you, Tom. Um, that was a really a great video, a lot of information um, packed um, in there. And I, I wanna see if we can sort of unpack um, the discussion a little bit. Um, as we discussed in your video, there's a lot of been a lot of changes in the petrochemical industry. There've been a lot of ways in which projections that were true in 2009, 2010, inspired this huge boom between 2012, 2018, and now have changed the way in which projections are, look, we look at now by virtue of the pandemic. What do you attribute those changes to? Well, the, the, um, there's um, the, the, the major, the major um, big picture change is the fact that the um, oil and gas industry as a whole has been um, in a profit decline for a better part of a decade. And they are looking around for um, new sources of uh, revenue and new more, more stable sources of cash. Um, they have always invested in the petrochemical industry. They've never really made the same level of profit that they made um, with oil wells and extraction. Um, but they're now looking for something. In some ways, the whole move by the oil and gas sector, you know, increasing its interest in petrochemicals has, um, is really a resignation to a lower level of profitability of the entire industry. Um, and that shouldn't be for, forgotten. Um, and that's true here, it's true um, in the, around the world. Um, and so you'll, you'll, you see that massive growth that you referred to, of um, cracker facilities all over the world. The U.S. planned, I don't know, 18 or 19, but China planned 40, you know, and, um, and, uh, and you, you, you see that supply going into the market, driving down prices and causing, um, you know, depressed profitability so that none of those cracker plants uh, um, that were um, looking at one set of economics, which was a highly restricted market, a lot of demand, um, and uh, and an ability therefore to, to um, make profits from them are now looking at lower prices and oversupplied um, position, and also as you pointed out, um, slower economic growth um, um, from both the pandemic, but also just before the pandemic, it was becoming clear that the the economic assumptions being made about the you know economic growth were, were going to be changing. They will be smaller and of a different quality. Um, and so the, I think those are your, your basic factors. You have an, uh, you know, an oversupply, a price decline. I wouldn't call it a collapse because it's not like the oil and gas industry has collapsed. Weaker economic and weaker economic growth are your major factors that are, are causing um, a generalized decline in profitability and a weakening of those, the viability of all those projects that were planned. 
So it's interesting that you use the word collapse. And this is sort of my last question. We're getting some really good questions coming in on the chat. But, you know, there's always been this question about, you know, could the petrochemical industry be a true plan B um, and rescue mechanism for uh, the oil and gas industry? Is that overstated? Is the sort of not, you know, where are we in terms of this, this discussion of peak demand and whether or not the petrochemicals can really be the saving grace and really keep the industry um, in financially viable territory well into 2050? Well, the, the, it, that depends what you mean by that. I mean, the industry, the, the, the oil and gas sector, you know, and with it, the petrochemical industry, um, you know, led the world markets for 20, 30 years. And in so leading the world markets were, you know, making 20, 30, 40, some of the things that I was involved in were 60 and 80 percent profits. Um, um, but that, that, that's no longer the case. It will no longer be the case. And this is this the energy transition that all of us see is in fact a readjustment of the profitability of the oil and gas sector. So you know, will petrochemicals supply a good deal of revenue and profit for the oil and gas sector going into the future? Uh, more than likely, um, but at a much lower level than has been historically. Uh, the case for the industry, and that means a much smaller industry, a much less financially important industry, and um, and I, I I believe from a political point of view also a weaker industry. That's that's really helpful to hear. Um, and so, in terms of the sort of, if we're looking at, and thank you for uh, correcting me about completing. Um, the sector um, versus the industries within the sector. We've seen a lot of rise in activity um, with recycling markets. They've had a tough time over the last several years with the collapse and closure of markets open in Asia. It's transformed the way in which a number of recycling businesses were able to operate. What role do you see the recycling business playing in the future um, of petrochemicals and whether or not that market is a true threat to um, the I would say the the financial profile of the new virgin plastic um, plants and, and that are being built. Yeah, uh, well, I'll I'll start with a financial argument and then go a little bit further in, in sort of the other direction. Um, financially, if you uh, um, um, the profitability of the industry, as I said, is declining, which means lower rates of return than were anticipated. Um, and that will mean an adjustment by investors and by the companies. Um, in terms of the impact of recycling on the financial viability of the petrochemical sector, it doesn't take 10 points of market share to, give the, uh, to impair the profitability of the petrochemical industry, um, uh, the impact that recycling could have. One or two points um, um, off the um, growth projections of the, or market share projections of the, um, of the petrochemical industry can, can have a, uh, um, a uh, extraordinary impact on profitability and investment. So that, that means that you're, you're going to see, um, you'll, you'll see a recycling market and it's like any other new market. It's got um, problems in it um, and it's a commodity market. So it has volatility problems and all kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, geopolitical problems um, in the US, but you have to look at the other side of that. Around the world, there's also now billions of dollars being invested in the recycling markets, right? And uh, those billions of dollars um, have behind them fairly substantial companies, um, and those companies are looking to make a return and looking to make the markets work. Um, this is not just a, a few, a few ind you know, individual companies. These are fairly large capital sources. The second thing that you have, besides the profit motive that's being um, developed and pressed on the, in the recycling side is that many companies, um, and this is where a lot of the activism has really had an impact, um, many companies have made promises to both their, uh, to their customers and to the public um, that they will be using 100% um, recycled plastics and see that in some of the water products of Poland, I think already, Poland Springs, I think already, at least publicly is reporting, they've achieved that 100%. 
um, uh, recycling goals. Um, but then you have other companies like, um, I think it was Coca-Cola just recently said they wanted to do something um, around the country where they would get um, basically a, um, a new deposit um, charge in order to fi finance and stabilize the uh, recycling markets because of the uh, because of the uh, volatility that you were just referring to, and with uh, which is which to those of you who might be listening who had anything to do with bottle bills in the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s when we members that Coca-Cola was adamantly opposed to the bottle bills. Um, um, and now they are looking to use that same financial technique to stabilize a plastics recycling market. So you have, you do have the, you have the volatility on the commodity side, which is causing uh, uh, stumbles. Um, in the industry, you have political opposition, obviously. I mean, within the plastics industry, um, there is opposition um, to, um, to plastics recycling. And, uh, and so you, you see, um, and, uh, and the uh, oil and gas sector as well. So it's a real conflict. Um, it's something that where the intervention of grassroots activity is really important. Um, and it, is, and it, has a, it has an effect, and it has an effect on the capital markets. So that's a perfect perfect segue to the next series of questions that have come up in the chat. There's been some questions about who are these investors? We know that there's was in different regions of the country. We've had a huge presence of Chinese investment that's come in in certain places. There's some questions as to whether or not these are uh, private equity firms that are taking a particular interest. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of who these investors are, what their what their risk tolerances with respect to this, you just described a lot of volatility that I would guess that certain investors have more of a tolerance for than others. Can you just give us a the over overview of that? Well well the the petrochemical sector is is uh is um is not um is a is a very big, big sector in, in the sense that it the uh, uh fossil fuels produce many kinds of um of uh, chemicals and plastics. Um, anybody sitting in, in a room right now, um, probably three quarters of your room is made of something made out of fossil fuels um, from the petrochemical industry, from paint to computers to um, um, gizmos and gadgets and phones and what have you. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, that's all, um, you know, that's all likely to continue. And so to answer your question on the finances, the finances are the institutional investors that are behind um, some of the larger, you know, companies that we all know. Um, the uh, you know the institutional investors behind Dow Chemical, the institutional investors behind um, behind um, behind uh, Exxon, behind all of them. I mean, they're the same. They're the same investors. They're looking to um, secure a profit niche um, in the uh, petrochemical sector. Um, and they're looking at a, um, hopefully, they're looking at it as a broader potential profit um, for the oil and gas sector than the oil and gas sector is currently providing. Um, and then there are your, your um, speculative um, smaller company investments, and they dot the landscape in petrochemical, uh, petrochemicals, uh, largely um, um, not publicly traded, um, small companies made by you know, um, uh, entrepreneurs who are putting together, you know, everything from little plastic bottles to um, all kinds of, uh, you know, badges for workers or who might have, I mean, and it's just an endless array. I, the numbers are in the tens of thousands of products um, that, are, that are produced. And so it's produced with big institutional capital and small investors putting their money in, involved. It's both. Great, that's super helpful. Um, so I think we're, we're just about um, wrapped up um, our, our time for this segment um, of the session. My hope is that we can particularly revisit um, when Sharon tells us a little bit about some of her uh, challenges and experiences in Louisiana. Um, so I think what we'll do right now is we will transition um, to Ms. Sharon Levine. As I mentioned before, she is from St. James Parish in Louisiana and has been um, engaged in leading her community in petrochemical expansion fights um, in that parish. So we'll roll video, please. Mm -hmm. 
My name is Sharon Levine. I am the director and founder of a faith-based Christian organization called Rise St. James. I'm the daughter of a former civil rights leader. Uh, I'm the a sister of two brothers and one sister. I'm the mother of six children, three boys and three girls. I am the grandmother of 12 grandchildren. I reside in St. James, Louisiana, been here all my life. In the spring of 2018, our governor, John Bell Edward, made an announcement that he had approved a $9.4 billion plastic facility to come into St. James on the West Bank, two miles from where I live. I didn't understand why would he do something like that. That just didn't set good with me at all. So one of my relatives by the name of Deborah, she told me that I should form an organization. I should get up and speak about the industry and speak about them putting industry into my community. I answered her, I'm not a public speaker, I'm just a teacher. I teach students of special needs. And that wasn't my calling to be a public speaker. So that she kind of was kind of stern with me about it and telling me I could do it. And I, I, I told her that I was a member of an organization called HELP, Humanitarian Enterprise of Loving People. I joined HELP in the fall of 2015. I went to the meetings once a month. I enjoyed going to the meetings because I learned so much about the industry. And I learned how many refineries and chemical plants that we have in the fifth district. Come to find out we have 12 in a 10 mile radius. When, when Formosa said they were coming into St. James, that's when I asked the members of HELP, couldn't, couldn't we stop it? They said, no, Sharon, we can't stop it because once the planning commission voted in, the parish councilor usually follow what the planning commission does. And I didn't understand how this worked. So I started going to the meetings and listening to people talk and finding out a whole lot of stuff that I didn't know. So in the fall of 2018, God must have talked to me or something because it put a change in me. With the Help Association, we had a march on September 8th. I, never, I will never forget it. That was my first time speaking out. I had my paper already typed to read it because I don't, I'm not a public speaker, so I, I read it. Me and my daughter got up there and we spoke. After learning about this industry, how it would destroy us and destroy the people that's living here and, and all about the chemicals, the cause of cancer and chemicals and all the emissions that they're gonna be putting in the air, in the water and in the soil. We are we are already facing all of these things now with these other industry. So this industry would bring more. It will triple in the fifth district. It will double in the fourth district. In the fourth district, we have nine chemical plants or refineries. And I, I just didn't, I couldn't rest. I just couldn't rest. The first meeting I had was in my den. We had almost 10 people there and we, I told them, let's start, a, let's start an organization. So we did. We started one because we, I was tired of hearing people talk about it's nothing could be done and we couldn't do anything about the industry. So the next meeting I had, it was in my garage. We had almost tw 20 people there. I had chairs set up in the garage. The NAACP came. I made a big pot of gumbo so we can draw the people, you know, because we, we down here, we love to cook and love to eat and stuff. So I figured that would be a nice little drawing card. So we had it in my garage and my daughter took notes. We had, she had a laptop and we, we were just so excited. From there, we started, we planned a march. We had our first march with Rise St. James on November 3rd, 2018. We had our little signs and walking and singing and chanting. It was nice. And that was my first time with a bull's horn, talking into that bull's horn. I talked so strong and told them how they want this plant to come in. It's not going to come here. We will not allow this industry to come here to, to destroy us. So from there, we started having marches. In 2019, we started having marches. 
We have one in May. We have one in October. And uh, we've been going ever since. Ever since that, we've been going. And uh, we stopped a chemical plant that wanted to come in Convent, Louisiana. That's across the river on the East Bay. This plant was from China. And we protest and we wrote letters and we talked to the parish council and we did everything we could do. We put letters to the editor and the paper. We did all kinds of things. And that plant pulled out. It pulled out. It, it just went back to where it came from. Rye St. James, we tried to protect the air, the soil, and the water in St. James Parish. We work on issues like that. Because if we can't protect our air, water, and soil, we're not going to live. How, we, we, we're not going to be healthy. My youngest daughter lived in St. James, but she kept on having headaches. So she moved to Baton Rouge. She don't have headaches as bad because of the, the pollution in the air. My oldest daughter was living with me. She would have sinus problems all the time. When she leave in the morning to go to work, she had to pass in front of two industries. They have so much emission that they put out at night in the early part of the morning. When you pass by there, you could smell it. And it, it make your stomach turn. It would be so, so strong. So she moved out too. And that hurted me because my children were leaving. People are sick and they are dying. You can't even go outside for a period of time without breathing that, the stuff that they emit in the air. And if you don't believe me, you can come to St. James and see for yourself. They disregard human lives. They disregard people at all together. They do what they want to do. They're coming to St. James. Our public officials vote them in. I don't know what they tell these public officials or do these public officials read. They just say yes for everything. When they want to put it in the, in the East Bank, in the white neighborhoods, they vote no for it. When they want to put it in the 5th District, where there's just black people, mostly the majority black people in the 4th and 5th District, they vote yes for it because it's not in their neighborhood. It's in my neighborhood. The 7th District, they don't have industry in the 7th District. They don't have in the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. But they have most of it is in the 4th and 5th District. And the 5th district has the most. That's where I live. It's, it's horrible. And I don't feel, just like God told me, not to sell my home, not to sell my land. This is my land. This is my home. And I'm not giving it up for Formosa and nobody else. <laughs>
and we would have fig preserves or pear preserves. We had fig trees, pear trees, and we, we would can things. And my mother would put it in the jaws and can it. I can't eat it anymore, I'm diabetic. So, but those were good eatings back there. And we had fresh cow milk. We didn't have to buy milk, we didn't have to buy eggs. My daddy would fix breakfast. He always did the breakfast. I don't know why, but my mama cooked the dinners. And uh, when we would go to school and everything, he would make us, before we would, I mean, on the weekends, he, we had a garden with vegetables in it. And that, I never forget, he would get us up at five in the morning to go and pick butter beans, snap beans, okra. And I used to hate it because I didn't want to get up that early. But we had to get up early, you know, to beat the sun. Mm -hmm. So he would take those big sacks of butter beans and vegetables, bring it to the French market in New Orleans and sell it. And that was money for our school clothes, school supplies, but whatever we needed. Mm -hmm. And we live off that. Now, if I plant a fig tree, I had two fig trees to die. I had an orange tree to die. My lemon tree is still there, but it's not bearing the way it's supposed to bear. We don't have that anymore. I have about seven pecan trees in my yard. I live on 20 acres of land. I have about seven. This year, they're not bearing. They, they skip a year. And when, whenever they do bear, it's not as plentiful as they used to be. It, it's so skimpy. I have one tree that might bear pecans, but the in, inside the shell is empty. So the, the industry has taken all that away from us. When I was a little girl, I was never sick. We didn't have to go to the doctor except for our vaccinations. And we, we all got along. The people in St. James are so nice and friendly and helpful. When someone is in need, the community come together to help them. We live together as a family. And now the people are complaining because of the industry. The industry has done so much damage to our community. They bought people out. When, when they bought white people out, when, they, when the black people likes to be bought out, they would answer, we bought the people who we wanted to buy out. And one man asked just recently, because he's living right next to a plant called YCI, Yang, whatever the name of the plant is, from China. They are the plant that's bought our high school. He asked them, can they be bought out? We don't, they don't have any money to give them to buy out. Mm -hmm. So some of the, the people are crying for help. Last night at our parish council meeting, the parish council voted for another amendment for Formosa. I was sick last night because I listened to it on the phone. I didn't know how to click in to ask questions, but somebody else asked questions for us and they still voted it in. I wanted to be on the agenda last night. I asked them to put me on the agenda. They told me, okay. They called Monday and told me they couldn't put me on the agenda because they are going virtual. And I said, okay. But Formosa was on the agenda and they voted last night for what Formosa wanted. So we are fighting this and our parish council are on Formosa's side. So Ty, before you start on that, and just sort of, that's where we are now with Formosa. You started in on this fight um, several years back and I think you have had a victory. We started to talk about the Wan Wan Chinese plan. So tell us a little bit about that journey for you. What, what, how you got involved, what made you decide to change focus from being, um, you know, long-term community member to activist and leading a group and found, you know, being the founder of an organization. <laughs> this wasn't nothing I planned. This happened all of a sudden. I was teaching school and I, we started in our new school in, in the fall of 2018. I had no idea I would be doing this because I'm not a public speaker. I just, I taught in my class. I spoke in my class. <laughs> Because the children that I taught were special needs and my heart goes out to those children. So my focus was on them the whole time I was teaching. And then when uh, 2018, when I heard about Formosa, it, it did something to me. It clicked in my head because I'd been going to the health association meetings and listening, not speaking, just listening. And all the things they would say about the industry was coming in and there's nothing you could do about it. The parish gonna vote it in. And I said, the parish can't keep voting these things in. And just my cousin told me I need to speak up. And I told her, not me. <laughs> so I guess I lied. So uh, in October of 2018, that's when I formed the organization. I told some of the people in the Help Association, I said, it's time for us to do something. We have to find somebody you know, to do something. 
and not knowing it would be me finding somebody I found myself, I guess. So, but if it wouldn't have been for God speaking to me, I wouldn't be sitting right here today talking to you. God is the reason I'm speaking to you today because he don't want to put this fight in me. When you say Formosa, that's a fight in me and it's coming out. It's coming out, I'm sorry. I can't hold it back because I'm getting ready to do a live stream and I'm going to expose the parish council. I'm going to lose friends, but I don't care. I, that's better than the community losing their, their lives. They're going to thank me later on. I don't care. I don't need to be thanked. But the point is, if we don't fight Formosa and Formosa is built, they have 14 industry inside the big complex. We will not be able to breathe the air. That's the point. I'm trying to make them see the point. Some people see the point. Some people don't. I'm educating the public. So I'm going to do a live stream and I'm going to tell them what's going on. A lot of people don't listen to the parish council meetings like I didn't listen at one time either. So um, I plan to do that soon. And we plan to do a billboard telling for most of you're not welcome here. Don't come here. So that's that's when I started in sept in October 2018. I retired in 2019, October 3rd, because I, I was doing a full time job. and I was so tired. So that must have been God's way of telling me to stop teaching and just do this. So mm -hmm. if I didn't stop teaching, I'd have been run down because I was tired. I'd wake up in the morning tired. So I don't have that anymore. So tell me, you know, you um, not only were new to becoming an activist, advocate, speaking out, organizing, Tell me about some of the things that you've learned about how communities can be impactful, because you seem like somebody who haven't been intimidated by the governor's influence in the big politics. You haven't been influenced by the big money of a global um, industry. Like, what would you tell people who just want to know what can I what can I do in my community? I don't I don't want any more facilities in my backyard either. You have to get out and do it. You don't have to, don't think about it. Just go and do it. That's, that's what I did. I didn't think about it. Just one day I said, let's form an organization. And they said, oh yes, let's form one. So I call a meeting and it went from there and it flew. It looked like something just pushed us and went out there. Next thing you know, the next month, people are calling and taking pictures of us. I said, where all this coming from? I don't want that. I just want to stop the plan. I didn't know all that came with stopping the plan, but I, I found out and I learned. And I have to Stay up on what's going on. That's the biggest thing. What's going on with the parish council? What's, if I don't hear something, they call me and tell me. They, they want me to do a march with the Black Lives. I say, I can't do everything. I'm trying to fight this plant. And y'all want me to stop doing what I'm doing to go organize a, a march? I said, let somebody else do that. Everything, they're calling me. I'm, one man wanted me to go talk to the mayor in the, in the other district. It's, it's in St. James Parish. I said, dear Lord, I can't do all of that. I'm only one person. I need someone to help me. I, I'm asking God to send me someone that could help me. I mean, really help me, work with me together, like sit here and we can figure out things together. It's hard to do it when you're by yourself. But the only thing that keeps me going, I know God is with me. And I, I know God is doing this. So that, that keeps me going. And I don't care if, they, if it is a $9.4 billion industry, nothing it's impossible for God. And that's what I lean on. And that's what I tell everybody. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, no. You know, but this, what I, what is so interesting to me about both your presentations, your Sharon's and Tom's is that there is this story about these facilities. You look at it from a financial investment perspective and Tom, you're looking at it from sort of the measurable, the, the metrics that typically dictate investment in large scale infrastructure. But we often talk about the externalities. What are the real life impacts on people, on environment, on water, on air, on soil that are not factored in to these particular equations. And I know, um, Ms. Sharon, you were telling me about um, just the illnesses that have impacted your family and community and just the cost that has had on your family. Tell us a little bit about um, some of what your experience has been like and just the way in which that drives you to um, continue your fight in this struggle? Well, first of all, my neighbor on both sides, one lady name is Helen. She, when she found out she had cancer, it was stage four. She passed away. My neighbor on the 
right side of me. When he found out he had cancer, he it was on his side of his face. And he just died last year. My one of, one of the members in Rye St. James, he was outside cutting his grass and he fell to the ground. So he, when one day I was sitting on my porch, he stopped by to tell me that he was going to the doctor to see if he had bone cancer. He died in November. And one of the other ladies that was in Rise, she died in August. She was a warrior. She spoke out. She didn't care, but she wanted to move because the industry was killing her. The pollution was too much for them in that, in that area. And nobody wanted to help them move. They would call on me. We have two people in wheelchairs down that street. They would call on me. And I said, dear Lord, I don't know what to do. And I, I tell it to other people that let's help these people. The industry will not buy them out. All we ask for at first is to buy that street out. They, they won't buy them out. So they're suffering. They're in the middle of two industries, New Star and Marathon. Then our church is a little bit further over. We were asked, why not sell our homes? Why should we sell our homes? Why don't they go somewhere? And I mean, they come in here and they take over our highway. We just got an alert this morning saying they got the highway is going to be um, very busy this morning because of construction, because of Formosa. The parish council gave them the, the, the go ahead. Something about a, a utility or servitude or something. So I'm going to pass there. I'll pass there almost almost every day. And if I don't pass there, other people pass and they call me and tell me what's going on. One said they had so many trucks out there. They don't care. They disregard everything. We have lawsuits against them. We have four attorneys that are working on this. We're trying to get some funding to hire another attorney to stop these. Uh, maybe to get these parents council members out. I don't know. I don't know what to do or how to do it or should we vote the parish council members out? Do we have somebody else to run in their place? It's hard to find people to run against these people because they're all relatives. A lot of them are relatives. So I was asked to run for councilman and I said, I don't want to run because God didn't tell me to run for councilman. I said, whenever God tell me to run, I'll run. But I'm pretty sure I could do a, I'm pretty sure I could do a better job than them. I can't, I I, I can't do anything. Um... I can't do it any worse. <laughs> Because they're the one polluting us. They, they say yes to everything that, that come across the desk, except for when Rise asked them, you know, to uh, do a moratorium. We asked that since last year in November. I stood in front of them and read the paper and asked them for a, mor a moratorium. They haven't even answered it. When, when I went to them in December, December 23rd, I'll never forget, I read my little paper and told them, you know, they have a grave site there and so forth. I don't know if they, I don't think they even knew they, they had a grave site. I brought it to them on the 23rd of December last year. Did they act on it? No. Let Formosa come and tell them whatever. They're going to vote on it that same night. So we don't, we, we don't need politicians. If I had to form, a, form an organization to protect the, the community, why do we need them? We don't need well, this, you know, it, so, so, you know, we've got several questions in our, in our chat and, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's amazing the close relationship between politicians and money and politicians and investors. And one of the questions we've gotten are like, who, who are the investors in Formosa? And I'm hoping Tom, you can help us answer that question to kind of dissect who these people are, how, you know, what, what's, what's their motivation, their drive? Tell us a little bit about the company, its structure and some of the financial. You know, they're a very big company. I don't, I'm, uh, we're just, uh, ourselves are just starting on the analysis of it. Um, but they are, um, you know, they are supported through um, both go um, government and then they have private in investors in many of these deals. So it's both. Um, and um, but uh, but the um, and uh, they can be, you know, they can be treated in the same way we've gone after um, other investors. But I think what what Sharon is, is saying is, is clear to me. Um, uh, as anything, is that the work that we do uh, in our organization is um, financial and energy, and we can, um, you know, help to make um, the the case. Um, but we're, we're just making a case in the in the energy and finance sector, and that is where the power is right now um, for um, how these things get decided. But the other power base is Sharon and the community organizing. And, and when, she, when she just said, you know, we don't need the politicians, you know, I'm a former public official and I agree 
that the dynamic for change here is between the people in the communities and the uh, companies that we can either kick out or get to cooperate. Um, and that the political forces, um, and it's more or less true everywhere, um, um, more true in Louisiana than uh, in many places, although I'm not on, I'm familiar with, uh, with um, corruption everywhere. Um, and so that's our dynamic. That's where we're going to win. And it's where we've been doing it. It's where we've been doing it um, in other communities. It's where Sharon's already won against one of the Chinese companies. Um, it's where people have been organizing and, and organizing has been going on on the coal uh, plants um, around the country. It was between the community and those companies um, and the capital markets. Um, the, you, we don't have... It's a, it's a sad statement as a former public official. We don't have public officials anymore. We just got us, um, and uh, and uh, and we're pretty potent. And so the organizing work that I see Sharon doing and other people who I work with um, is probably more important than any policy. They'll come and they'll do the right thing after we settle it with the businesses and stuff. Um, but chasing the capital markets and chasing these companies out when they are when they are doing what they're doing here um, is job number one, and uh, and there's no th this particular company. I mean, I've done a little enough research to know that this facility, if it wasn't built, in the whole scheme of things, would mean a damn. It, and, and probably the company itself is not going to make the return that it wanted to make in the first place. The pollution, the devastation. And the and the loss of human life is gratuitous. It's not even it's not even where it was ten or fifteen years ago, where they could say, "Well, we're going to make a lot of money, so we're going to do this." They're not even making a lot of money anymore, um, and they're doing it anyway. And it's a real um, and it isn't a necessary plant for the functioning of the economy. Um, but they just keep doing it, um, and uh, because they can make a little bit of money, and they're scrambling the big capital markets are all scrambling right now. Um, and, and we pay the cost, the people mm -hmm. pay the cost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so just as again, another housekeeping administrative issue, we're gonna extend the Q and A to 2.15. I think we're um, getting some really interesting comments and it seems like it would be a shame to, to cut this off early. Um, what I would like to do, I wanna kind of steer the conversation back a little bit on some of the finances um, Tom, and then I think, um, Sharon, for you, I, I want to get back to you because we're getting a lot of really powerful questions about your story is so compelling and we really want um, to be able to support you in some way. And I don't know enough. I'd love for you to share with um, us about how people can help. You mentioned a webinar and um, I think we've got some, some big groups on the call too who want to know comprehensively in terms of strategy, like what, what are the, your lawsuits currently that you're currently engaged in? What are those about? What is, uh, what are your campaigns? What are some big deadlines that maybe people can start thinking about? And then I'm hoping that Sandy and others can help connect our participants today with you and, and really truly begin to build some, some links and bridges with that. So, so given that we've got a, a few more minutes, um, <coughs> excuse me, please. Um, Tom, my question for you that came up in um, the chat, you know, it sounds as if, you know, clearly the industry could continue to do business as usual, build these plants, consider families like Sharon, sort of gratuitous, you know, sort of cost of doing business and so forth. How much of that, that cavalier attitude is nauseating anyway, but just from a financial perspective, how much of that is likely to lead to a stranded asset scenario and how close are we to that now and how is there a likelihood that that would happen within the next five years, particularly where global growth projections are have been offset by by COVID? Yeah, well, I don't I don't really know what you you know what everybody means by stranded assets anymore. I mean, this just this year we've seen um, I think Shell write offs almost twenty billion in investor losses from its oil and gas and petrochemical um, um, issue um, um, investments. BP, very similar numbers, 17, 18 billion. Um, they're losing value, they've been losing value. Exxon, you know, in, um, 
less than 10 years ago was worth 500 billion, you know, they're worth half that now. Um, and uh, which is still a lot of money um, and they're still pretty powerful, but you know, they, they're, they're not as big and as powerful as they used to be and they're losing money all the time. So the question of the, the whether or not that, whether or not the asset and um, if they build Formosa, whether or not it have to shut because of, uh, because it has um, you know limited um, profitability and can no longer be done, um, we, we will see some of that go on. Um, but what I but I would hope they would do, and we're seeing this as well, uh, is there are cancellations of many of the of the projects that you mentioned early on. Um, you know. Um, uh, dozens of cracker plants around the world that were once thought viable and have not been built yet um, can be stopped, and they should be. They should be stopped financially. The this discussion that we've been having in Ohio on the PTTGC, which is a which is a Thailand company, um, uh, um, they're not sure whether they want to go forward, and they don't. And they're not sure because of all the reasons we raised. You know, plus the uh, plus the pandemic. I think for most of faces the same thing, and the more pressure that you know can be built. You know, maybe maybe they walk away. I don't know. I don't know. It looks like they're pretty far down the road, and um, but you never know. Um, these boards, um, the boards of directors, can be impacted sometimes in ways that we don't even understand. Um, but they are impacted when people raise their voices and when people keep doing and putting and putting the pressure on um, in, in the ways that they in the ways that they can. So um, they're vulnerable. The companies right now have to be looking at every one of their financial decisions a second time. And um, I mean, they 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 think they don't care about the issues that we're raising here. You know, and they want to just say, oh, it's just the cost of doing business. But Oh, but, uh, oh, you know, they're getting a, a, a the, the message is becoming louder on the public side about the, the discontent over fossil fuels from a climate point of view and then from a local pollution point of view. It's much louder than it ever was. Um, and uh, and then their finances are tighter um, and they have to balance that as well. Those two things, I think, can do go a long way to making them um, you know, change a lot of the investment strategies that they're making over time. You know, as we think more broadly about climate, it's all too slow, um, um, and uh, and there's too much devastation that's already been, uh, it's already occurred. But there is, there are the the, the moment is now um, to to um, to keep doing the work that we're doing. Oh, for sure. I, I think I, I think that I agree. I think that's right. Um, I, I definitely, it's been interesting to watch um, just in this, uh, over the last several months um, with the Black Lives Matter movement, the power of um, reputational risk and the power of um, wanting to take a stand to be on the right side for purposes of uh, consumer, um, to meet consumer demand um, for change. Um, you know, but it, it does bring me back to, we have a very certain, we have, I feel like we have a different level of engagement and um, influence when it comes to uh, social activism. Um, and then you look at a country like China and um, Chinese investment has been a very big um, part of this petrochemical build out in the United States. And Sharon, you mentioned that the Wan Wan plan was part of the, the first victory that you had. I'm just curious, Tom, in terms of when you look at both political dynamics with Chinese investment, Trump's trade war, for example, and then you look at some of the um, ways in which they are abandoning plants. You know, it sounds like they have a different um, motivating factor in terms of investment than um, like a Formosa. What do you think the um, different drivers are and, and how important does a, a role does, I guess, give us an overview of Chinese investment in, in yeah. petrochemical build out. I mean, that's I, the best way to do it. Two seconds. Um, um, the, I don't, you know, I, I'm uh, not going to pretend to expertise here except to say, that in the uh, in the in the in the way that we've been looking at it is there is um, there is a general desire um, of most countries in the world, including China, to continue to um, control their own resources um, and their own markets. Um, and with China, because it's so big, it's able to be a little more um, adventurous. 
and uh, um, and politically adventurous as well, and and they have a a financial agenda that is somewhat is very different than how the um, than the, in terms of size of how the United States um, pursues um, its its interests. But now there is this disagreement um, between the um, between the two countries, and there'll have to be a reset at some point. That's all going to take time, and I tend to look at these things somewhat strategically somewhat from a market point of view um the strategy to me is i don't see chinese investment taking place to support these projects in the u.s in the near future doesn't mean it won't later on um, um and so any place there you know we're seeing you know there was a hope of bringing in a lot of chinese investment into west virginia that's probably not going to happen uh, to build out the plastic some um, um uh issues there's some talk um uh, PTTGC just lost their South Korean investments and they're saying, well, we could, maybe we can bring in China and all that. That's a fantasy, you know, that where it's just being raised because the Chinese, they also have their own development issues and uh, the banking system there is going through changes where, where, where maybe the major motivation could have been political at one time. I think it's much more um, a balance between commercial interests and political interests. And so um, we can we can um, play to that as well because these investments are not viable investments. And so you can we can begin to make those those pitches as well. So you know um, I, I, I see, um, you know, and with the, 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 um, the current trade, trade tensions, it's probably you know, in the short term useful for us stopping projects. Um, then, uh, and, but I don't know how it's going to be in the long run. I don't, I don't know. Um, so so just, just in terms of given the sort of unique dynamic, it's like Formosa is a Taiwan company and you've got this yeah. sort of Mm -hmm. one country to to system kind yeah. is there are there people looking at the way in which that dynamic is may or may not be having an influence in sort of the unfold like is it a competition issue is it a like i'm, I'm just curious the, the extent to which those particular political dynamics may sure. be the, affecting the, investment and the, this the disruption between the uh, taiwan and china is, is going to have an impact on this project you know, I don't know how um, we're learning, you know, every day we have some staff over that side of the world and we're, you know, turning our attention to it and trying to figure it out. Um, I'm not going to say I know for sure what the, what the political dynamics are, but when there is, ten, you, that whole move of South Korea moving, the South, the Dalim moving away from PTTG, which was a Thailand plant, is showing us lots of things about both where the Thailand government is, where the South Korean government is regarding not just the money, but the, the technologies that they wanted to bring into the United States and whether or not that's actually viable given the very trade issues that you just talked about, you know? Uh, and, uh, and so the, yes, to answer your, I mean, they become more complicated and you need smooth, normalized trade relationships in order to make these things work. Um, and when they're um, in conflict or in turmoil, um, that um, will that will suggest delays here in the United States, independent of um, of, um, of regulatory delays that might otherwise be experienced, or delays that are created because of community opposition. So you 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 and those delays over time. Um, the projects become more expensive, they become more time consuming, they become more of a problem, and they're marginally profitable at this point. So that's why I argue for more community organizing and more kind of advocacy like the kind that uh, a number of us are doing to go to the banks, to go to these in, 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 uh, import export banks and to go to the governments of those countries and say, you know, maybe this isn't the best thing here, but it's got to come from, it's got to come from the grassroots because our politicians, they seem to be deaf. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, and I, I, I like that, uh, that point is that all of these, um, geopolitical uncertainties, all of the trade-related issues, all of it means that Sharon Formosa is not a sure thing, and don't you stop fighting? 
because God knows that you got a lot of people supporting you and encouraging you and who um, very interested in um, supporting you. And so just before we wrap up, I just kind of wanted to get from you, Sharon, a sense of what are some of the things and some of the ways that people can support you, participate far or near, whether they're in Louisiana or in Mexico or in New Zealand. I think there are a lot of people who know, don't laugh. There are a lot of people who know um, that this plan exists, that its expansion is, um, that it's unnecessary, it's contributing to oversupply, and it's certainly not worth the lives and livelihood of your family and community. So please just give, uh, take a couple of minutes, let us know how we can better support you. First of all, you can support me, first of all, with prayers. Second, you can support me by getting me in touch with Joe Biden. That's the second thing. Third thing you can do is call my governor, John Bell Edward. He can stop this right now. He's the governor of this state. He won't meet with me because of, the, well, I guess because of the virus, but before the virus came, he, he wasn't meeting with me. And when I saw him on November the 1st, Last year, he came to get my vote. Then I, I couldn't get a meeting with him after that. I called his office and we set up meetings and stuff. But I couldn't get to him. So if, if you can call John Bell Edward and ask him to put a halt to this industry, or at least until the pandemic is over, then we can go from there. But if I can speak with Joe Biden, if I can meet him face to face, I think I would be able to talk to him and tell him what's going on in St. James. I would like him to come to St. James, not just pass by on interstate, come on the river road on highway 18 and see what's going on. Once he see it, he will know what I'm talking about. I believe you, I believe you. All right, from your lips to God's ears, we've got to charge people if you've been listening. You don't leave this conversation and think uh, and leave it there. We've got some people to support in St. James Parish, so. All right, uh, Miss Sandy, um, I want to thank everybody who um, has been participating, who joined us, and um, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Sharon, Tom, and Lisa for that very powerful conversation. And we hope that if you would like to keep the conversation going, you can stay here on the website. There's a, a function where you can chat, you can connect with the other participants. Uh, and there is a, a Twitter feed going on at hashtag AIFA2020. And you know, as we saw here today, that one of the wonderful things about this conference is that we learn so much from the work that people are doing around the world in their own communities. And part of the way we're highlighting that this year, since we can't all be face to face, is with a series of videos. And uh, just as this session ends, we're going to play a video for you on the wonderful work of Cambio Puerto Rico, led by Ingrid Villa Biaggi. And I hope that you will stay and watch that. It just takes about eight minutes. And we also hope that you will be right back here with us on Tuesday when we will start another session at the same time on renewables taking market share from fossil fuels. Thanks again and goodbye. I'm Ingrid Vila. I'm an environmental engineer. So that's how I got into environmental issues. I actually studied environmental engineering. I have a bachelor's degree uh, in environmental engineering from Cornell University and a master's in environmental engineering uh, with specialty on water studies from Stanford University. I've served in government a couple of times. The most recent one, I served as chief of staff for the Commonwealth in 2013 and 2014. I had the pleasure of meeting Ingrid a number of years ago when she served as chief of staff in the governor's office in Puerto Rico, while I was serving as the regional administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency. Ingrid is one of the single most effective professionals I've ever had the privilege of working with. I worked very closely with her on trying to get support and resources to an economically struggling but absolutely beautiful community called Caño Martin Peña, where there was an effort to get people better housing and to dredge an old canal so that it could be ecologically restored and be a resource for the community. We, we didn't really call it climate change resiliency at the time, but that's exactly what it was. I also worked with Ingrid on trying to convince the U.S. military 
to clean up the Vieques firing range. For over 60 years, the beautiful tropical island of Vieques was used for military operations and practice ranges. The Department of Defense left behind a legacy of unexploded ordnance. It was a federal Superfund site that EPA was responsible to clean up. Having a partner in the governor's office to try to pick up the pace on that cleanup was really helpful. Right after I left government, I founded a non-for-profit organization in Puerto Rico called Cambio uh, to support communities and promote sustainable and responsible actions for Puerto Rico. We started Cambio in 2015. Our first project was supporting communities who were fighting against a waste incinerator that was being proposed for Arecibo, Puerto Rico. Communities were opposing this project, yet government was not paying attention uh, to their claims. So we came in and started supporting communities, working together with them. They wanted to build the incinerator of trash in Arecibo. And it was a struggle that we, it took us at least about almost 10 years. Ingrid has been a big help to us with all these other people, experts, scientists, doctors, and academic people, religious people. <laughs> We did a real good job educating the population to understand why we were against this incinerator because, you know, it, it contaminated and the health issues, the environmental issues. So we're ha very happy that we have prevailed. <laughs> After Hurricane Maria, the island was left entirely without power. A lot of sectors didn't get power back for up to a year. So we started focusing on energy um, and sustainable energy alternatives. Unfortunately, in 2018, right after the hurricane, the governor announced that he was going to transform the electric grid, but he was going to do so through privatization and through methods that would continue to pursue fossil fuel investments on the island. And that's how we came up with um, Queremos Sol, which is the shirt I'm wearing today. Queremos Sol, which is We Want Sun in English. It's a very diverse group with very many peoples from different organizations. We have the Electric Union from Puerto Rico as part of Queremos Sol. We have professors from the universities. We want to transform our electric system to use renewables, okay? We live in Puerto Rico. We live in the tropics. We've got sun all, all year. We're proposing a sustainable transition to 100% renewable energy using rooftop solar and battery storage, and also promoting a collective purchase alternative that will make it more feasible for communities to be able to acquire solar PV systems. The proposal would put more power to the people um, people would have ownership of the system. They would have control of consumption. So the consumer transitions to being someone who is active in the system, in the grid, in participating in decisions that are being made instead of just being a passive uh, customer. The damage and the shock that Hurricane Maria represented to the people of Puerto Rico suddenly opened the door for people to be receptive to alternatives, for people to start to think about what is the condition of our energy infrastructure and what is the most sensible solution to reduce vulnerability. We need to invest the infrastructure money on rooftops, solar, renewables. We keep insisting on that and we keep insisting the why it's important that no more fossil fuels in Puerto Rico, no more. And so, People now are getting more interested in finding that. I want to know about more about this Queremos Sol group. In terms of the coming year, I'm quite excited about developing this model for collective solar purchase on the island to see if we can actually develop something that will make it affordable for people to be able to acquire these systems. At the same time, I'm quite excited about a modeling work that we're doing actually along with AIFA that will detail what type of investments in infrastructures need to happen in order to get to 100% renewable using rooftop solar. And that is going to be a really powerful tool because when we are able to uh, demonstrate 
with modeling that this is something attainable, that this is something that can be done. I think it'll be really difficult for the power authority executives and those in charge in government to tell us that uh, this is something that cannot be done or is something that is too costly or something that um, could be considered maybe in the future, but not now. So when we finish this modeling work, I think we're going to be in an even better position to pursue our objectives in Queremos Sol. It's a no brainer. And Puerto Rico will only transition to a clean energy future if the leadership comes from the residents of Puerto Rico. But the residents also need some technical expertise and some strategic support. And that's where Ingrid comes in. No one's better at this in Puerto Rico than Ingrid. I would argue no one's better than this in the country. Ingrid Vila is, you know, one of the most extraordinary people I have ever met. Um, I'm very proud of her with her knowledge and her determination, you know, to do what's right and to help so many people. I think that we can do this now. 